So our, our results show us that even before ears start working in this blue column, lateral line knockouts here in red have a reduced hatching response, revealing that lateral line function precedes ear function and enables very early attack-induced hatching. Then as embryos develop, both ear and lateral line function seem to improve the hatching response. So our oldest embryos all hatched and we couldn't pick out any uh, treatment differences in hatching response. So we also examined latency to hatch as a potentially more sensitive indicator of lateral line contributions. We found that even these older five-day-old embryos with very well-developed ears still use lateral line input to accelerate their response. Next, we wanted to know more about how the lateral line system develops over the period of plastic hatching. So we took pictures of more embryos stained with diasp so that their neuromasts were glowing. And we labeled each line of neuromast in frontal and uh, dorsal view. We found that the number of neuromasts in all seven lines increased with developmental stage across the known period of mechanosensory acute hatching. In fact, from the stage where acute hatching starts to when it, when it becomes consistent, the number of neuromasts more than doubles. And here we see individual embryos sorted by whether or not they hatched in response to jiggling cues on the y-axis, and then the total number of neuromasts that they had on the x-axis, um, colored by developmental stage. And there's a couple of interesting things to point out here. First, both stage and the number of neuromasts were significant predictors of hatching. And also, when embryos had fewer than a threshold number of neuromasts, none hatched, whereas embryos with more neuromasts often hatched. And we found that this threshold number of neuromasts was 247. For some comparative context, uh, flounder, tuna, grouper, and catfish all hatch with only two neuromasts. And red-eyed tree frogs hatch with 247 neuromasts. That is many more than described for any other species at hatching. And this suggests that precocious sensory development may facilitate early escape hatching in this species. In summary, we found evidence that embryos can use both their ears and lateral line systems to sense egg motion cues. And really small developmental increments in both these sensory mechanisms drastically change their capabilities to respond to snake predator cues. Okay. The research that I'm going to show you next is not technically in the dissertation, but it's related to the work that I'm doing on sensory development. And I'm just very excited about it, so I want to share a bit with you here. So for this next experiment, we manipulated developmental rate by rearing embryos under different thermal conditions. Warm conditions sped development up, and then cold conditions slowed development down. And the idea here was that if mechanosensory acute hatching and sensory ability just happened to develop at the same time, just by chance, uh, warming and cooling the embryos would desynchronize that match. And this figure shows the developmental trajectory under our three thermal groups. So we clearly see that warm treated embryos developed faster and cool treated embryos developed slower relative to, to individuals raised under ambient conditions uh, shown in green. And across these three different temperature treatments and for each tested individual, we quantified the developmental onset of escape hatching responses to, Q, to two Q types to assess when embryos begin hatching in response to hypoxia, we submerged eggs in degassed hypoxic water. And to assess the onset of hatching responses to physical disturbance cues, we jiggled embryos with a metal probe, just as we did in our lateral line experiment. Here we see the onset of both hypoxia acute hatching, shown with hatch marks, and uh, mechanosensory acute hatching, shown with solid colors, across all three temperature treatments. And this top plot shows these two responses in terms of chronological age, while the bottom shows these two responses in terms of developmental stage. And we see that the temperature uh, treatment had a significant effect on chronological age at response onset, but no significant effect on developmental stage at response onset. So in other words, warm treated embryos started hatching in response to hypoxia and jiggling much earlier in time, sometimes even two full days earlier than cold treated embryos, but the first embryos to hatch to each Q-type were the same developmental stage regardless of temperature treatment. 
And the first thing I asked was whether changing the developmental rate of embryos disrupts the ontogenetic alignment of ear function measured with um, vestibular ocular reflex and the onset of mechanosensory acute hatching. We found that in each thermal treatment, uh, ear function or VOR amplitude on the y-axis appears concurrently with the onset of mechanosensory acute hatching on the x-axis, even across the brief three-hour period between no response and yes response. So even in cool-treated embryos, which developed really slowly in that three-hour period, we still see a synchrony between increase in VOR and the onset of the mechanosensory acute hatching response. As expected, we saw more change in the hot treatment, but the responses were similarly aligned. So changing the developmental rate of embryos does not disrupt the ontogenetic alignment of ear function and the onset of mechanosensory acute hatching. This further supports our hypothesis that sensory ability mediates predator-induced hatching in these embryos. Next, I wanted to take a closer look at embryo ears and explore how their development affects sensitivity to disturbance cues. And in order to do this, I got to spend almost an entire summer dissecting out a ton of teeny tiny ears. This is a pen tip for scale, this is one ear. I looked at ears and embryos just after they started hatching in response to stimulated snake cues and then sibling embryos three hours prior to the onset of that response. We see that embryo ears develop a ton in just this short three hour time period. So these are confocal images of whole mount ears just before and after the onset of hatching. We see that sensory hair cells labeled in green and synaptic connections in red. This is an even closer look at one of the vestibular sensory surfaces. And we found that both hair cells and synapses develop a lot over the onset of this response. After the onset of this response, the sensitivity of vibration acute hatching continues to increase. This figure shows hatching responses across vibration amplitudes at three different ages. And if you compare the hatching response of four-day-old embryos in orange versus five-day-old embryos in light green, we can tell that older embryos respond to much lower, um, lower amplitude vibrations, reflecting an 80-fold decrease in sensory thresholds to feel vibrations. And this growing sensitivity of vibration acute hatching in older embryos makes a lot of sense based on their continued ear development. Ears grow really rapidly in size and complexity throughout this period of increased vibration sensitivity. In summary, clearly developing sensory capabilities of both vestibular and lateral line systems play a role in enabling predator-induced escape hatching. But again, just because an embryo can sense vibration and hatch does not necessarily mean it should. So now I want to transition to the second part of my dissertation focusing on hatching decisions. As a reminder, not everything shaking eggs in a rainforest is as threatening as a snake. For instance, rainstorms also generate intense vibrations in egg clutches, but pose no threat to eggs. Evidently, there is a lot of uncertainty and ambiguity inherent in cues. So embryos face a discrimination challenge where it can be tricky to make an optimal hatching decision. Since these cues can be tricky to interpret, Embryos will sample multiple vibration properties to assess risk and distinguish among different types of physical disturbance. For instance, we know from prior research that the duration of and intervals between vibrations matter, and low frequencies are stimulatory while high frequencies are inhibitory. And vibrations recorded in attacks and played back to embryos can induce hatching, and so can simple synthetic stimuli made from bouts of white noise we can create custom vibrations such that we have complete design control over properties like temporal pattern and frequency. We can then present these custom stimuli to red-eyed tree frog embryos in trays and track how much they hatch in response to really subtle differences in vibration properties. And perfecting this system took a lot of time, but it ultimately gave us a lot of experimental freedom to tweak various stimulus parameters and test what precise properties these embryos care about when making their decision to hatch. One of the vibration properties that embryos use to modulate escape hatching is frequency. So the gray bars show hatching in response to synthetic stimuli of different frequencies. And then red is the mean frequency spectrum from parrot snake attacks. And then blue is the spectrum of rain. 
And we see that embryos hatch more in response to low frequencies and less in response to high frequencies. And this is consistent with the fact that rain excites a lot of high frequencies, which indicate low risk and inhibit hatching responses. Embryos also use temporal pattern. And this shows a contour plot of hatching responses to playbacks varying in the duration of and the interval between vibration pulses. And some patterns, um, like here in yellow, cause higher hatching than others. We might expect that the properties of natural stimuli would match up with these embryo responses to synthetic stimuli. And in our initial analysis, the mean pattern of rain fell here, which seems reasonable. But here is a cat-eyed snake and here is a parrot snake. And it seems that their attacks would not induce hatching, but we know that they do, both in real attacks and in playbacks. So something seems to be missing here. I think it suggests that just looking at temporal properties as simple rhythmic patterns may be an oversimplification of risk cues. Perhaps embryos parse temporal patterns in more complex ways. So unlike synthetic vibrations, recorded snake attacks don't show consistent rhythms. Instead, um, they tend to include a mixture of shorter and long pauses. Um, so perhaps simplifying vibrations down to an average rhythm is obscuring a lot of important information. Adult frogs are known to attend to multiple levels of temporal pattern information. So female tree frogs of many species discriminate between advertisement calls with different trill rates or pulse repetition rates within a single call. And they also discriminate between calls that are produced at different rates. So a short interval between calls may uh, make that male more attractive, but the same half second interval placed within a call could make him unrecognizable. So the meaning of silence depends on where the gap where the gaps fall in relation to these other elements in a complex pattern. Perhaps embryos, like adults, also parse temporal pattern information across multiple levels of analysis. And to test this, we conducted a series of vibration playback experiments. For each experiment, we constructed vibrational stimuli with different combinations of the, three, of the same three uh, simple elements, 0.5 second duration pulses, 1.5 second intervals, and 30 second long gaps. Based on responses to rhythmic playbacks, we expect the 0.5 second on to 1.5 second off pattern to elicit a high hatching, while combining the short pulse duration with a 30 second long gap should not. However, how do embryos respond to stimuli that combine all three elements in different ways? So all of the experiments were based around this simple rhythmic pattern of 0.5 second durations and um, 1.5 second intervals, which we already know elicits a lot of hatching. We introduced a single 30 second gap after the first three pulses, creating a prefix to uh, make a slightly more complex temporal pattern. And if the meaning of this long gap is consistent, it may reduce the response to the space pattern. However, since snake vibrations can include longer gaps interspersed with shorter ones, we predicted the presence of this long gap might heighten risk perception and then amplify the hatching response. And our two controls featured each pattern component on its own. So either a single prefix or repeated long gaps interspersed with single short pulses. We found that the prefix alone and long gaps alone elicited almost no hatching. And this result is consistent with what we would predict based on our model of hatching responses to rhythmic temporal patterns, that 30 second long intervals should elicit really low hatching, but increasing, uh, but adding a single gap to a base pattern after a single three pulse prefix actually increased hatching rather than reducing it. And this suggests to us that even though long intervals are not scary to embryos in our simple analysis, as part of a more complex pattern, they can add to risk perception. And this might be relevant in a natural context as a way to help distinguish snake attacks, which can have long gaps from hard rain, which tends not to. We then asked how much vibration is even necessary to elicit high hatching. So we tested smaller and smaller segments of the base pattern, so groups of 10 or three pulses separated by 30 second gaps, compared with our base stimulus as a control. 
And this bottom stimulus has only 30 pulses while the base has 150 pulses. So we've replaced 80% of the vibration with silence. Does this reduce the hatching response? We found that the hatching response was similar to all three stimuli that included periods of the scary base rhythm, even periods as short as three pulses. However, if considered on a per pulse basis, so this is normalizing by the number of pulses in each stimulus, we see that the hatching responses increase with the amount of silence relative to pulses. In addition to hatching proportions, we also considered the timing of hatching and found that in real time, inserting long gaps slowed hatching, so embryos waited longer to hatch. But when you subtract the times of the gaps, considering only periods of vibrations, we see that embryos hatched with fewer vibrational pulses when they're interspersed with long gaps. Our data from this experiment suggests that some perception of risk is continuing to accumulate through these silent intervals. The meaning of silence seems to be contextual and can actually elicit more and faster hatching in embryos. We saw that adding a 30 second gap increases the hatching response which suggests that embryos are retaining information for at least 30 seconds without stimulation. Is there a point at which this no longer occurs? We tested gap lengths with uh, 30 seconds, 45 seconds, and 60 second gaps as compared to our base stimulus. We found that gaps of 30 seconds and 45 seconds both significantly increase hatching compared to the base stimulus. But when the gap gets to be a minute long, the hatching response goes back down to what it was for the base stimulus. And the latency to hatch was around the same for all stimuli, regardless of, of gap length. So our results suggest that embryos have a mechanism to retain information for at least 45 seconds without vibrational stimulation. And this might not seem like long, but for comparison, the active time over which some adult frog females can remember uh, which of two males was making a more attractive call is not much more over 45 seconds and often less. So our, our results suggest that the information processing and retention abilities of frog embryos, at least for certain, certain critical types of information, is on par with those of adults. And we expect embryo behavior not to be as complex as the behavior of adults, but for some crucial behaviors important for survival, we may not be giving embryos enough credit. We show here that embryos, like adults, can parse complex temporal patterns on multiple levels and retain salient predator cue properties for long periods of time. All in all, embryos practice a very impressive, highly functioning decision-making process. We know that they use multiple vibration properties to distinguish between threatening and non-threatening stimuli, and this work demonstrates another level of complexity to embryo risk assessment strategies. And our study of complex temporal pattern processing in these embryos could motivate and inform a reanalysis of natural vibration recordings, utilizing more complex decision rules based on these identified embryo capabilities. And this might help resolve the behavioral mismatch in our initial analysis of hatching responses to rhythmic temporal patterns. And hopefully this will bring us one step closer in identifying the plausible analysis rules under which the measured properties of snake vibrations would appear to elicit hatching and those of rain would not. So for my last chapter, I really wanted to examine the notion of uncertainty or ambiguity in cues. The, the information from biotic and abiotic environments that animals use to inform their behavior is almost never perfect. Even stereotyped auditory or visual signals that are initially clear and honest because they've evolved to influence the behavior of others can change and degrade during transmission due to a gamut of natural and or anthropogenic noises. Moreover, not all signals are honest since animals can evolve to deceive each other. So a relatively large body of work addresses ambiguity in contexts such as dishonest signals or effects of environmental noise on communication. However, we understand considerably less about how animals cope with ambiguity in incidental cues generated by non-communicative activity. So examples of vibrational cues include frogs that fall silent in response to footfalls, and elephants that pick up seismic vibrations through their feet, and antlion larvae that detect the footsteps of an approaching ant. And such cues are critical for foraging and defense, but selection on the cue producer might act to reduce their perceptibility. Thus, 
Compared to stereotyped signals, incidental cues may be fundamentally more variable, ambiguous, or cryptic. All of this is to say that animals face substantial variation in both signal and cue ambiguity when making decisions. So how do red-eyed tree frogs respond to vibrational stimuli that vary in ambiguity, and how do these responses change across development? In assessing risk cues, embryos can either make the right decision to hatch when there's high risk or wait when there's low risk, or two types of mistakes. Missed cues occur when embryos in danger fail to hatch, and false alarms occur when embryos hatch early unnecessarily. The mortality costs of these errors can change across development. So younger, under, underdeveloped embryos face more challenges in the water and are less likely to survive aquatic predators. Thus, when, as thus, they face a higher cost of false alarms compared to older embryos. So when presented with ambiguous cues, we predict older embryos to hatch more than younger, younger ones, showing adaptive developmental change in how embryos make their hatching decisions. To test this hypothesis, we performed two experiments that varied ambiguity in different ways based on hatching data from prior studies. In the first experiment varied ambiguity in the temporal pattern domain. So this clearly threatening pink stimulus represents the tip of the hatching landscape where a yellow means more hatching. And then the second experiment varied ambiguity in the frequency domain with similarly threatening low frequencies, um, benign high frequencies, and then uh, in between ambiguous frequencies. In the temporal pattern experiment, all three stimuli varied ambiguity in temporal pattern, but kept a, a constant threatening low frequencies. Whereas in the frequency experiment, all three stimuli varied ambiguity in frequency, but kept a constant threatening temporal pattern. Thus, as an additional form of ambiguity in both the green stimulus or the uh, clear cue of low risk, and to some extent the orange ambiguous cues, cue, um, frequency and temporal patterns provided conflicting information. And this was true in both experiments with scary frequencies and non-scary temporal patterns and scary temporal patterns and non-scary frequencies. Looking at the hatching responses in both experiments, we do see an interaction effect with the greatest developmental change in response to the more ambiguous stimulus in orange, consistent with the prediction of adaptive ontogeny. So younger embryos facing more risk in the water hatch less in response to ambiguous cues, while older embryos facing lower costs for false alarms opt to hatch more, um, even when faced with ambiguous information. And the fact that we found similar effects of ambiguity across these very different cue property domains really strengthens the case for ontogenetic adaptation. And as we've seen already, the latency from stimulus onset to hatching is often a useful indicator of cue sampling. When we take a look at how long it took for individuals to make their hatching decisions, in both experiments, as expected, younger embryos delayed hatching for longer than older embryos. And this suggests that older embryos generally take less time to assess cues and base their decision to hatch on less information. In general, we might expect inverse patterns of behavioral responses um, and latencies to respond on the right, such that stimuli that elicit more hatching also elicit faster hatching. And we do see this pattern in our frequency experiment where our threatening cue in pink yielded the most and the fastest hatching. And our benign cue in green yielded the least and the slowest hatching. And then the developmental change in both variables was greatest in response to our more ambiguous stimulus in orange. However, latency patterns, unlike hatching responses, differed between experiments that varied ambiguity in temporal pattern versus in frequency spectrum. So in the temporal pattern experiment, we didn't see the neat inverse responses that we saw in the frequency experiment. And we think this is because information from these vibration properties, temporal pattern and frequency, accrues at very different rates. In general, information accrues as some decreasing function of sampling but the rate depends on the type of Q and Q property. So some properties such as frequency might be evident immediately. And in contrast, temporal property information accumulates gradually. And the more rapid accumulation of frequency information compared to temporal pattern information 
may explain patterns in our latency data. First, in the temporal pattern experiment, the Q conflict between um, frequency and temporal properties seem to decouple the linkage between hatching response and hatching speed. In fact, for younger embryos, the fastest hatching occurred in the benign pattern that ultimately elicited the least hatching in green. And this pattern had the longest duration of vibration pulses and thus exposed embryos to a rapid accumulation of vibration at frequencies indicating high risk, but a slower accumulation of temporal pattern information indicating low risk. So in this situation, individuals perceiving lower false alarm costs like older embryos closer to spontaneous hatching may cross a threshold to hatch based on scary frequency cues before sufficient temporal information accrues to lower their risk assessment. So we've seen here that latency can reveal nuances of how embryos deal with conflicting information from Q properties. So to recap, this study shows that embryos adjust hatching decisions to ambiguous cues in predictably adaptive ways. We hope our conclusions here may inform approaches to studying how other animals use incidental or ambiguous vibrational cues to make important behavioral decisions. In summary, this dissertation advances our, our understanding of the sensory mechanisms and cue assessment strategies underlying the vibration cue hatching of red-eyed tree frogs with broader implications for understanding the development of behavior. First, we demonstrated that both embryo ears and lateral line systems play important roles in mediating the hatching response. And then we examined how ear development is correlated with improved sensitivity thresholds to vibrations. Lots of embryos across diverse animal taxa, including fish, amphibians, reptiles, invertebrates, commonly use physical disturbance cues to inform their hatching timing. So here I've shared photos of just a few of my favorite examples. Despite widespread occurrence of mechanosensory cued hatching, until now the mechanism for mechanosensing, for mechanosensing in ovo was entirely unknown. And I think it would be interesting to investigate what sensors are involved in these widespread responses. Lastly, chapter three, or sorry, chapter three addresses the very general and understudied issue of how animals parse temporal pattern information from incidental cues. We found that red-eyed tree frog embryos perceive temporal patterns of vibrations at more than one scale. And finally, we show that embryos make decisions in a way that matches the changing balance of costs and benefits. And this contributes to the body of evidence for adaptive ontogeny and to our more general understanding of the multi of the multiplicity of factors affecting behavioral development. Collectively, my dissertation research shows that embryos combine information from multiple sensory modalities and deploy impressive cost-benefit risk assessment to determine whether or not to hatch. My work on decision rules highlights the potential nuance and complexity of Q assessment even in these really early life stages. It cautions against oversimplifying assumptions about early life stages and demonstrates the value of embryo hatching for research and animal cognition. This dissertation has truly been a collective effort, so I want to take this chance to briefly thank all the people who have helped make this work possible, including my advisor, Karen Workington, my committee members and collaborators throughout the year, my lab family, and my funding sources. And lastly, thank you all for sharing the virtual table with me today. <laughs>